I knew this ahead of time. <laughs> That's why, if you didn't notice already, um, you actually had an insert in your bulletin today. We figured that this would be a good safe spot to put it. Uh, You'd keep a hold of it, and best of all, because we put it in the bulletin, we knew that none of you would read it. <laughs> but this is actually pretty close to word for word the sermon that I would be preaching to you today if I had a normal amount of time. But it's okay that I don't have a normal amount of time, that you have a little bit of homework to do, because I wanted to do something special for you all. Uh, one of my big personal passions, especially as we have people who are uh, finishing their baptismal preparations, is to figure out what's next. And one of my big personal passions, and I preached about it a, a little bit ago, I went on some tangents some time ago, is the idea that a lot of our baptismal preparation will get people into the baptistry, but doesn't prepare them for a relationship with Jesus that sustains beyond that. We do a great job of helping people become Seventh-day Adventists, but we often struggle with helping them become a personal relationship with Jesus sort of Christians. And so uh, what you have before you is a part of the book that I'm writing on how to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the section on daily devotionals. And so this whole chapter in here, and I'll explain it in just a minute, is the section on, uh, I call it Use Soap Daily, but it's how to have a meaningful devotional, and that's what I would be talking about if I had more time. So my encouragement to you is to take the time to get into not only this guide, but more importantly, to get into God's Word. If you already have a personal relationship with God and a meaningful devotional life, then you don't need my tips or my, my suggestions. Keep doing what works for you. I'm not giving you here what works. I'm just giving you what works for me, and hopefully this will be an encouragement in, in your walk with God as well. And so if you need some tools and tips, some ideas on how to have a meaningful devotional, uh, you can get it in here. But I do have a few things to say, a few things to explain, maybe a few uh, ways to help you understand this. And I want to start by asking... Pathfinder is getting ready to leave for Oshkosh on Monday. What I say, some 60,000 people will be joining them. Noel, where did you move to? Because you're not here. Where did you, Noel here? Or is Daniel here, Daniel Gonzalez? Yeah. Uh, how often will the Pathfinders be able to shower? He pauses and thinks because it's not an easy answer. Maybe twice. I want to ask you, I want to give you a chance, just pause for a second, you've sat and listened and watched for a while, just with the person next to you, what is the longest you've ever gone between showers or baths? When was the longest you've ever gone between a bath and how did you feel? What are we coming up with? Anybody go more than a week between baths? Yep, all right, there we go. Oh, I got a text here who will rename, rename, remain anonymous a couple of weeks. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm one of these people who like, my job doesn't really work that hard. You know, I, I'm blessed to be able to, to generally have a comfortable place to do my ministry. I'm often inside while I do it. Uh, I know that there are people out there who actually work and labor and sweat, and, and they have a hard time with, their, uh, like with the, the work that they do. Six weeks? Are you kidding me? I don't want to know who this was, but my caller ID didn't pop up. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm somebody who generally likes to shower at least, one, or I'm going to say on average about once a day. If I have an extra hard day, sometimes I'll actually shower once in the morning and then once before I go to bed. Anybody, by the way, anybody a morning shower person? Morning bath? How about an evening person? Anybody evenings? All right, so we've got a little bit of a split there. Pathfinders, and for each of you, though you might not have the opportunity to take a bath 
every day while you're at Oshkosh or as you go through life. My hope and my encouragement is that you do have an opportunity to become clean every day. The Word of God gives us a powerful promise, something that I was reminded of a couple of weeks ago when I was up at Camp Asable for Pastor's Retreat. The quote found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pathfinders, you might not be able to take a physical bath every day, but church family, you can be made clean every day by the blood of Jesus Christ. Is that good news? So one of the things that I hope that you do as you daily connect with him, uh, as you continually pray, as, as Paul would talk about, I hope that you have a regular opportunity to dialogue with Jesus through both prayer and your Bible studies. When we talk about daily devotionals, I've got just a couple of tips for you. I want to pray, and then I want to share these tips with you, and then we'll still be done by 12.30 because that's when lunch will be ready. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to gather to celebrate people giving their lives to you. Lord, we know that there were not only people who did so publicly, like Hannah and Paul, but maybe there's somebody here today who is going to make a private decision, some sort of personal commitment in their hearts. They're going to decide that they want to commit to you. And Lord, I pray that this, this time together as we reflect on how to get into your word and how to encourage each of our walks with you, Lord, I pray that these tips might help somebody in their journey with you. Maybe it's a first step, or maybe it's a, a, another step in a lifelong process. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, one little... Disclaimer I want to put before I give you devotionals, uh, give, give you a talk about devotionals. There are people who will read their Bible every single day and not know God. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. I've mentioned before that they're, uh, the person that I consider to be one of the, the strongest voices that is, is challenging our church right now, the Christian church right now, is a gentleman by the name of Bart Ehrman. He knows the Bible better than anybody in this room. I guarantee it, myself included. He is one of the prominent experts on the New Testament. He is, uh, he is the chair of the religion department at the University of North Carolina, and he is a professed agnostic. He reads his Bible every single day, studies it faithfully, but professes to be an agnostic, does not know the author of the Bible. My goal for you and your devotionals is just not simply to say, did you check the box saying you read your Bible today? Because would you agree, you can read your Bible and read the Word, but not know the author. In fact, there are many people who will treat the Bible like one of these things. This, of course, is an encyclopedia. It's full of all sorts of interesting information, great facts, and wonderful details. There's something you can do. It's well, uh, it's well categorized. Uh, you go through here, and there's wonderful pieces of information that may have an impact as you, uh, as you remember what was done in the past. Maybe we would not make some of those mistakes here again today or in the future. But there are people who will just simply treat the Bible like it's an encyclopedia or some other reference book. We will go into it looking for information and that's how you judge how successful your devotionals are. If I were to ask you how do, you know, for those of you who had a devotional today, some of you are morning time bathers and sometimes are nighttime bathers, so some of you haven't had your devotionals yet. But if you've had a devotional recently, if I were to ask you, did you have a good devotional, we would way too often judge it on how much information we gathered and how much we can recall. We're treating the Bible like an encyclopedia. Instead of that, I want to suggest that the Bible is a love letter from God to you. Amen? And what we need to do when we do devotionals is to not just study what Moses wrote about his time in Israel with Israel, or not just study what Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, Corinth, or some of the other churches that we will actually be doing a series about this upcoming fall, starting in just a couple of weeks, as we work chapter by chapter through the epistles, myself and my seminary pastors. Don't just look at what Paul said. 
You should be asking yourself, what is God saying to me through what he had Paul say to them? And so that process sounds uh, complex, doesn't it? It sounds hard to, to ask yourself, what is God saying to me today? But amazingly enough, it's easy. We just get caught up on our own feet sometimes. We often get misguided or, or, or well-intentioned people might set us down a wrong path. One thing that I have found for people who struggle with their devotionals is that they're often trying to eat too much in one sitting. How many of you have ever tried to read through the Bible in a year? How many of you have successfully made it through the Bible in a year? For those of you who weren't able to keep your hands up for both of them, let me guess if this was what you did. You started in Genesis. Good. And you started to read through the stories. Now, because you're reading through the Bible in a year, and the Bible is 1,189 chapters, your daily reading plan probably had you working through three or four chapters a day. In the beginning, that's fine. Three chapters in the beginning get you through creation into Adam and Eve. With the next day, you'll get into Noah. By the, by the end of the first week, you'll have had a few days with Abraham's story. And Abraham has some really interesting stories. You'll spend four or five days studying Joseph. Anybody here a fan of the story of Joseph? It's quite a powerful story. And then you get into the book of Exodus, and the first half of Exodus is Moses and the plagues and the, let my people go, right? And you're doing great for the first 70 chapters of the Bible. The 70th chapter takes you, by the way, to the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai. While Moses is up there, though, you hit your first roadblock. We now spend the next, like, 20 chapters with a little bit of interspersing, a couple of stories, but God lays out the sanctuary plans, the sacrificial system, and explains in vivid detail, four chapters a day, how to build the portable tabernacle. And once you've become a master of that, you turn to Leviticus. And you cover the entire sacrificial system in two days. You make it through Leviticus, and it's something like 30 chapters. And you hit numbers. Anybody here a math person? For those of you who aren't math people, numbers actually does contain a lot of numbers. It's the numbers of the tribes. And you get some of the longest most boring sections in all of Scripture. Check out number seven sometime for your devotional. That's a doozy. And then you get to Deuteronomy, which is basically just, hey, everything I already told you before, let me tell you again in sermon form. And then Joshua's good, and Judges is crazy. And you're starting to move again. If you made it that far, you're starting to move again. You get to the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, which, by the way, are misnamed. Samuel dies partway through 1 Samuel. The books aren't about Samuel, especially not 2 Samuel. These should be called the books of David, but that's just a rant. You make it through the books of 1 and 2 David, and then you hit Chronicles. Ten chapters of genealogy. I see some of you already shaking your head saying, no, sir, that's not for me. Does that sound about right? Three and four chapters a day within your first two months, that's what you've covered. Some 3,000 years of history. We have, with our reading plans, by trying to swallow so much in one turn, we try to treat the Bible like my high school uh, field trip treated the Smithsonian Museum. Anybody here ever been to the Smithsonian? I went to the Smithsonian when I was a freshman in high school. We were on a field trip with band. And while we were on this field trip, they scheduled us to go to the Smithsonian. They said you can go to whichever of the main museums right there on the mall that you want. And we've got two, count them, two hours for you. We are looking at some of the most remarkable artifacts of all of human history. We went to the U.S. Museum and looked at American history, and there are remarkable pieces of American... I mean, the Smithsonian is the National Museum for a reason, and I'm not even kidding. We basically had to walk through the museum, and I'm sorry, AV guys, you might want to go for a wide shot, because I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of space here. 
I basically had to walk through the Smithsonian like this. Wow, that's cool. That's awesome. Take a picture of that. I'll look at that later. Wow, that's cool. Amazing. And like, that's how I had to walk through the Smithsonian. I literally had to take, we had a student conductor and I literally had to grab her by the hand and drag her through the last like three portions of the exhibit. And we had to run across the mall to get back on the bus because our two hours were up. We treat the Bible like that, like it's a hundred yard dash. We start and we've got to finish as fast as we can. My encouragement, instead of reading the Bible that way, is to slow down. What's the rush? What's the rush? On December 31st, you expect a gold star to get mailed to you. You can stick on your, your lapel or a pathfinder. You can get pinned with something saying, congratulations, you read the Bible through in a year. Well done. You think there's a prize for that at the end? Might I suggest, instead of treating the Bible like my high school treated the Smithsonian, why don't we treat the Bible like my mom treats the Smithsonian? Any of you ever go to an art museum with, a, with somebody who actually understands art? Or you ever go to a museum with, with your parents or, or somebody, and they just go there and they just stop? And they stand there and they just look and soak it in and appreciate and marvel and are amazed and just blessed by what they're experiencing. And I've already done like three trips to the, the cafeteria and they're still just standing here just soaking it in. And then they move to the next one and I move to the car. <laughs> Why don't we do more like that with our Bible? Amen. Why don't we just take the time to soak in those passages? You know, like the one that I read to you earlier from 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, our reminder to use soap daily. That passage that, that John wrote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I could do a sermon series on that. And instead today I have enough time to give you just a sprinter's view. Take a picture of it and check it out later. Slow down. Don't take a book in a week like I'm going to try to rush you through this fall. Instead, slow down. What's the rush? Andrea, for example, told me, studying the book of James a couple of years ago, five-chapter book, took you, what, six weeks to get through the book of James? And like every day, she'd come out and just say, yeah, I got stuck on another verse. And she just, God was talking and, and hitting her and just Getting, uh, getting, it got her attention. It was amazing just how deep she was able to dive by slowing down. By the way, as a Seventh-day Adventist, our church's foundation, our heritage, comes because one man decided he was going to sit down and read his Bible only as fast as he could understand it and no faster. A gentleman by the name of William Miller back in the 1800s, decided that he was tired of all of the preaching and all of the sermons and all the commentaries and everybody else's opinion. He just wants to read the Bible and only go as fast as God reveals it to him. And it's him and it's his Bible and a concordance and that's it. And out of that heritage, he ended up cre uh, creating a movement that had, depending on who you ask, between 50 and 100,000 followers as they were getting fervently ready for Jesus to come, and our church came out of his heritage. And it's not just William Miller's example. I've got a quote in your study guide. Top of the second page, one of our pioneers, a lady named Ellen White, wrote a fantastic book called Steps to Christ. Uh, I actually teach personal spirituality, or I'm finishing teaching personal spirituality at Andrews. A uh, little busy at home. It's hard to keep up with the class requirements. <laughs> But that book, Steps to Christ, is one of my textbooks. It's one of the most remarkable books on personal spirituality that I've ever found. 
And she says, while talking about your personal devotions, she says in page 90, but there is little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. One can read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. One passage studied until its significance is clear to the mind, its relation to the plan of salvation is evident, is of more value than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in view and no positive instruction gained. Rather than reading chapter after chapter and meaning nothing to you, what did she say you should read? Just one passage. And let God speak. So how do you let God speak? I've actually got some suggestions for you in your study guide. If you didn't notice, soap on the marquee, in the bulletin, it's just the word soap on my on my study guide, and this isn't Pauletta's fault, I snuck this in later. There's little dots in there, because SOAP isn't just a word and a thing that we use. SOAP is an acronym for a process that you can go through for taking a passage and intentionally mining it for relational information. You're not just studying it like it's some, uh, you know, like it's an encyclopedia. You're studying it, and you're trying to listen for God speaking. And so you'll see on the, on the inside page here the section for soap. You'll read through the scripture, and then you'll read through it again more slowly, more carefully, and you'll pick your favorite scripture, and that is the S in soap. Next, you'll sit down and write down your observations about the passage. What are the details about what you read Keep track of the who, what, when, where, and why of the passage. And yes, when I say keep track of, it often helps to write it down. You'll notice, by the way, on the back is a sample of what my soap layout might look like. Your journal, uh, if you will. It's on the right side of your page. So I have a sample passage for you to do as you work on your sermon for today, because I don't have time to preach a sermon today. This isn't a sermon. You got it? <laughs> Your sermon today is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, when Jesus teaches about how to pray. And we'll talk more about prayer in my next homily in two weeks, after I'm done baptizing Lindsay and dedicating Eric and another big celebration. We'll do more, uh, just another glimpse of how to have a walk with God. But you'll see there a section for where to write down your scripture, where to write down your observations, the things about the passage that stood out to you as interesting. The next section is applications. This is where you will go through and prayerfully apply what you read to your own life. You'll want to do it, of course, through the framework of making sure that it's got good theology to it. You may not want to uh, go through and say, well, I see that they, they mentioned a fish in that story, and, and maybe so-and-so represents the fish. And don't go into, don't, you don't have to get complicated. But it's not a bad thing from time to time to put yourselves in the shoes of a character. I have to admit, every once in a while, I feel like a Mary Magdalene, and it's okay to say that a guy can, can stand in and feel like a female character sometimes. Just kind of put yourself in those shoes. It's okay. I'm not going to tell anybody. But look for ways that you can apply what you were taught to your life. And then finally, you've done the S, you've done the O, you've done the A, now it's time to P as in pray. Ask God to help you take specific steps based on your observations and applications and pray that God might help you grow in your relationship with him today. If you follow that process, it could take you 10 minutes on a passage. If you follow that process, it could take you a month on a passage. But that's just one of many ways that you can connect with God's Word in a meaningful way. I actually personally prefer what's on the other side, which is the alphabet method, because it then challenges you to keep track of things like who Christ is. Who is Jesus Christ in this passage? Especially when we're doing our readings in the, epist in the epistles coming up here in a couple weeks. Paul can't stop talking about Jesus. He is all over the place in Paul's writings. Paul will be talking to Ephesians, the church of Ephesus, and he'll be giving them good theology, and all of a sudden just break into prayer. And, oh, thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Some of you know people like Paul, by the way, who still live today. Anybody know people who just, like, they're talking, and then all of a sudden they just break into prayer? Nobody? We need to get you out more often. <laughs> so my, here, my whole point here is this. 
you need to have a chance to connect with God daily. Use soap daily or some other method, some process that works for you where God can speak to you in your heart. Remember, the power isn't in simply reading the Bible. The power is in connecting with God. And so I hope you take the chance to intentionally put yourself in a place in His Word where He can speak to you, where He can change you, where He can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I hope you take the chance today and every day to use a little bit of soap. Anybody want to make a commitment today and say, you know what? I think I can do this. I want to connect with Jesus in his word daily, and I'm not doing it just for information. I want to hear God speak to me today. Anybody want to say, I- I'm going to work on my devotionals, help me to be better in my, my personal worships? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, like I've said, to celebrate decisions that were made, and perhaps the decision that was made right here. Some of us might have looked at your word and just seen some ancient uh, collection of texts, uh, a pile of facts and information, but nothing that's really relevant for us today. But, oh Lord, as we were reminded by our scripture reading, your word is a living word. It's not just something that Paul wrote or that Moses wrote or that David wrote. It's you speaking back then, today, and forevermore as you try to connect with your people and help us to get to know you better. And so, Lord, I want to pray for this church family today that we would make a decision to connect with you intentionally in your word. Lord, I pray that we would all be cleansed from our unrighteousness, that we would use soap, that we would turn to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd invite you to stand now as we sing our closing song. Number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Thank you.